Today I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. 26. It says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, you will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then, come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary. So, is taking, who is taking you to the court? Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Thank you, Eduardo. Wow, great to see everybody here today. Lots of good things are going on, and... Uh, Lots of good things are happening. It's great to see people together. We're having connect groups tonight, and so hopefully you're part of that and being able to just associate with other people and uh, make those friendships and relationships. That's great. Uh, starting next week, I need your help. Um, we did this last year, and uh, it was helpful for us to kind of see where we were and what you guys were thinking. So last year we had a survey and uh, we're going to pass one out next week. So the best way to get that done is for you to do it online because it automatically adds everything up. So we will send out an email next week. If you're on our email list, if you're not on our email list, call the church office, look in your bulletin, figure out what the email is, and send an email in so you can get the email about the survey. I know that's a long way around. So if you do not have anything to get an email or go online to do a survey, we will have paper copies here next week. All you have to do is fill it out, drop it in the box. Somebody else will go online and enter all your things in so that we can get it to tabulate for us. No math errors here. So we want to just try and keep up with things. It's a little bit about worship, but it's also a little bit about everything that we're doing here. And so we just want your feedback on, on how things are. Uh, and you can think that it's going to make a difference. <sighs> right? <laughs> it may. It may not. <laughs> we'll just see how that goes. I'm not making any promises. <laughs> One of the things that happens is if you fly you realize it's going to take you a whole lot longer because of one incident. On 9-11, some people threw, flew planes into the towers and it changed how everything is done. All of a sudden, we realized violence was possible. And all of a sudden, we said, uh-oh, we've got to change everything. And so it's going to take you an extra hour at every airport, in every place that you go, just to go through the check and security, and they're going to take all the stuff that you forgot to pack. That's kind of become normal for us. We're used to being aware that there is great violence in our world. And that's what we want to talk about today is about this great violence that we do have in our world because that really is core. That really is the beginning. And for you to live your life or make any changes in your life, you have to know that it's there. And you have to know that this is just a part of the way that we live and a part of everything else. Don't make it part of your life, but you have to know that it exists. And how are we going to be able to deal with it? And how does God see that? How does God deal with this? We look at the violence that we see on the news and in all of the things around us, and we look at the violence we see in our entertainment. I tell Nancy, unless something blows up, it's not a good movie. That may say a lot about me. We see violence in video games. We see violence in all kinds of things that happen around us. 
And that's one of the things that the Bible talks a lot about, because this is not something that's new. It is not worse in our generation. We did not invent it. We maybe have elevated it from the time when I was younger. We're just getting better at it, and it seems to be everywhere. But it has been there for a long time, for a very long time. In fact, Jesus was very concerned about this. There's a command in the Old Testament not to kill, not to murder. And Jesus addresses that command in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. And so he talks here about, you have heard it was said, you shall not murder. And that would be the correct term. It's not just don't kill, it's that you're not going to murder. And so you have to understand that's really what the translation is about. This is number six out of the Ten Commandments. And so certainly there has to be an understanding of what he's trying to say here. There's no way I can cover everything on this topic this morning. So abbreviated view, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, apply these things and, and make this something that's part of your life. He says, I do say to you, and so as Jesus talks about this, he says, my concern is not that you don't murder. I'm going to change that because of anger. And the real violence that exists today is because of anger. And so Jesus addresses this as anger violence, and here's what happens, and here's his answer to all of that. He says, I say to you, anger is liable to judgment. Well, that's not good news. Insulting people, calling them names, calling them a fool, uh, we've heard a lot worse than that. But he says, when you start insulting people, when there's cruelty involved, when there's violence involved, when, when we start taking advantage of people, he says, I'm going to lump that in there with everything that you're doing. It's not just about did you kill them, because we could play with that a whole lot, right? I didn't kill you. You did spend two weeks in the hospital. But you didn't die, so therefore I didn't break the command. And Jesus says, no, we're not playing that game. It's not about how badly you injured somebody with your cruelty. It's not about how mean you were to them. It's that I don't want you to be mean at all. And that this is the problem that has existed since the beginning. I mean, we look at Adam and Eve, and they seem to do well. They get thrown out of the garden, but the first two brothers, one kills the other. And so we've got this from the very beginning, from the very first time, and Jesus begins to address this. And he says, here is the problem. It is this anger that we have with each other. And not only that, that we would do things, but we would also malign their character. We would say lots of things to get back at someone. We would try to get in trouble. We would assassinate character as much as we would someone else. Sometimes the biggest weapon we have is our mouth. And that can do more damage than almost anything else. Because certainly lives are destroyed because of that. The example that Jesus gives is if you remember that somebody has something against you while you're sitting here about to take of communion. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's the passage, right? When you're coming to offer your praise to God, when you're coming to commune with God, that would be our translation of this passage. And you remember that a brother has something against you. He says, I'd rather you go talk to your brother than for you to take the communion. That's pretty serious. What, you don't want me to worship? Not until you can get things straightened out with your brother. I would rather you straighten things out with him than anything else. Realize whatever is not good with your brother, that, and this is always interesting, that he has something against you, well, what if I don't have anything against him? You know, it's all his fault. I don't have anything against him. He's the idiot. Oops. And so there we go. And we've already messed up. He's trying to say whether it's you that has something against him or him that has something against you, I don't want anything to be there. 
go and I want you to be reconciled to your brother. So what does it mean to be reconciled? Well, reconciled means to change your feelings towards someone. It means to get back together with them so that the anger is no longer there. Now, they may not be your best friend. They may not be people that you're going to hang out with all the time because a lot of times when there is something that has come between you, it's difficult to get over. It's difficult for all those feelings to go away. But forgiveness is certainly possible, and we work on the rest. So when forgiveness is possible, this reconciled is possible, you're changing your feelings towards someone else so that this goes away. I'm not going to let it affect the way that I talk. I'm not going to let it affect my relationship with them. It's just one of those things. It's one of the hardest things for us to get over. Well, that's his first example is, you know, when you know there's a problem, go take care of it. His second one is very interesting. It assumes that you're guilty. Why would it assume that I'm guilty? You know, when you're going to court and he says, you need to make peace with him or else you're going to have to pay the full fine. You're going to have to pay all the penalty. Well, why would I be paying the penalty if I'm innocent? So I think there's an assumption that while you're going to court, don't be so conceited that you won't admit your part in what's wrong. Because as you go, you're going to get before the judge, and the judge is going to accuse you, and he's going to, he's, God says, I'm not delivering you from that. You didn't do what I said. And sometimes we want to pray afterwards. Oh, well, God, please take care of this. Please handle this. Please get me out of jail. He says, I told you, do something about it on your way there. Do something before that. Make some kind of concession. Get back together with that person. Admit your guilt. Admit your fault. Apologize. Do whatever you can. That's God's instruction to us. Don't let that be a problem, even if it's on your way to court. Don't assume that God's going to protect you from what you did wrong. God's the judge, remember? And so you certainly want him to be on your side. You certainly want you to be the one who's doing all these things, right? So violence is seen as the same as a murder. Jesus takes away for the reason for this kind of murder. He says, I don't want you to be angry. He says, the law said, the Old Testament law, the law of Moses said, I don't want you to murder anyone. He says, I don't even want you to be angry with anyone. I don't want you to have done anything that would upset them or cause a problem. And so as you look at the Old Testament command in, in Exodus 20, in verse 13, it's very short. It doesn't even take up a whole slide. You shall not murder. That's it. Cut and dried. Everybody got that? That's what it says. So don't do that. Do not kill anyone on your way home today. And you've done very well at keeping this. The prohibition is not that people won't die. Understand that. The prohibition is the fact that you are the one who causes it. Okay? And that's really what he's talking about. The Hebrew word here can assume any death that occurs, whether it's by carelessness or by negligence or by anything. He says, I don't want you to be the one involved in doing that. So premeditated plots of, you know, I didn't cause their accident, I just cut the brake lines. No, okay? You do not be involved in any way in this. And so when you look at that, that's the command that he gives from Mount Sinai, do not murder. Violence has been a problem from the very beginning. Violence was the reason for the flood. I know sometimes we want to assign other things to that, but he says, no, the world has become so violent, I cannot put up with them anymore. Violence is that number one thing that God cannot stand. However... God uses violence, right? Seem a little inconsistent? If violence is the reason for flood and God uses flood to take care of violence, do you see the problem? 
wait a second, God, aren't you the one being violent? You can't say, I'm not guilty, I just backed up the water. No, that's the same thing for us. So it's not that God cannot kill. It's not that life will not be lost. It's that we are not doing it. Okay? It gets complicated. Like I said, I don't have time to do everything. But let me give you a few passages from the Old Testament in how they would deal with this and the way that we would talk about this. From the time of the flood, you see in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Is there a problem with that? So you're using murder to be the cure for murder. Really? Something kind of wrong with that, isn't it? If it's the murder that's the problem. Leviticus 24, 17, whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Hmm. In Ecclesiastes 3, as Solomon writes, he says, there is a time to kill and a time to heal. But you realize there is a time to kill, and the time to kill is when there's a punishment that God has made. And so when another person kills, he, he kind of says that's put on us. And so this is how it was to be treated in the Old Testament. It was a cure for murder, and it was more killing. Hmm. I'm not sure it was the right solution to say, here's what will stop it, but certainly that's God's punishment for it. And we see that this is something that continues. God gave it in the law of Moses. It's explained as eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. When someone kills you, then you can take his life. But the killing is not the problem. The problem is the guy who murders, right? That's the prohibition. Do not murder. Do not become one of those guys who murders. It's not that people won't lose their life. All of us are going to die. Did you know that? I mean, maybe that's not the good news of the day. The good news of the day is and then all of us go to heaven with God, but it's not about death because all of us are going to die and all of us are going to be in that position at some point where this is what's going to take place. God's command is we don't need to be the killers. That's really what he's talking about. There's a planned loss built into this. We do not last forever. After 150, 200 years, so you're probably going to pass away. I and mean, it's the years that did it because we just got old enough. Well, who's at fault for my murder? Well, it's not murder then, because it is not about the death. All people die. Dying's not a sin. Aren't you glad? It's not a problem. But we don't have the right to take it from somebody else. And so it's about stopping the one who kills. No amount of anger or injustice will justify killing. I know sometimes we get that. God however, does change it some for New Testament. And so let's look at the New Testament passage that kind of deals with this. Jesus' answer is in the New Testament. His answer is, I want you to forgive them. I want you to get back together because I think anger might be the problem. But what happens when it's not anger? What happens when it's not a anger violence situation? Romans chapter 13 Paul talks about government. And he says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever, ex whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror for good conduct, but for bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. 
for he is God's servant for your good. And if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on wrongdoers. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. I realize this sermon's going to be the sticky one, okay? So we're going to talk about a lot of things today that might be pretty sticky. We don't like this passage. This doesn't seem right. How can God hand over this idea of punishment to the government? Well, you realize when Paul writes this, he's writing about the Roman government, the one that would put him in prison, the one that, you know, you can't really say Nero was a good person, that he's a great emperor, Augustus, any of them, that if you can see what's going on in the Roman world that time, it's not an endorsement that these people are like God and that these people have a, a holy government. It's not the holy Roman Empire, and it's not anything that we would look at as saying, well, this is a great government that, you know, we would look at that and go, we disagree with this. In fact, if there's a vote, we want to vote no. You don't get to vote. Paul isn't talking about the validity of the government or whether the government is good or bad. Obviously, the one he is writing about is not. It is the one that will be persecuting Christians, if not already at this point. He isn't advocating a right or wrong as far as government is concerned. He's saying they have their own responsibility before God, and we have ours. And they are held responsible for the things they do in government. But God sometimes uses government for his purpose. Paul in prison was not his purpose. But yet, God uses that situation to be able to spread the gospel. Into the prison, into the place at Rome, into all kinds of places. And it doesn't mean that it's fair, and it doesn't mean that it's right. It means it is God's plan. It's what he says. It's how he wants it. It's not up for us to argue about. Now, we can have lots of discussion about whether the government is good or bad, and we even get to vote on whether it is good or bad and have our choice be known, and we can say all kinds of things about it. But the simple fact is, when it comes down to people who have committed murder, I think in our day and time, this is what he's saying. I'm going to let government handle it. It is not eye for eye. It is not tooth for tooth. The government bears the sword. They will be the ones who do it. Do they do it right? Not the point. The point is God has selected them. And so, hopefully that makes sense as far as what God is trying to do. Sometimes, as you see in the Old Testament, it is the nation of Israel that is used to punish the wicked. The reason for them going to a promised land was not just, well, I like you guys better than those guys, and so why don't you come in and just drive them out and kill most of them and push them out. In fact, my command is I want you to kill them all. It was because of the wickedness of the people in that place. It was their punishment that Israel went and went to a land of promise so that they could take that, and it was the punishment for the wickedness done. That's why you see all of that happening. We see David as one of the greatest warriors and one of the greatest kings and one of the greatest holy men all at the same time. David kills Goliath. Basic story, right? Well, but he says don't kill. Yeah. And they're in a war. And there's a battle. And David does not just run out there and say, well, I'll just take care of this guy and run out with a sling and knock him down. He starts saying, well, what has to happen? How do we get there? Who gets to fight? Maybe I could be there. And he goes to Saul, and Saul is the one who says to him, okay, you go. Government, right? 
and David goes. And you see all of this happening with David, and it's not something that goes against the commandment that God gave. You have to understand what the commandment is. It's not murder. And I know there's lots of opinions on this. I'm glad I'm up here. <laughs> I'll give you guys a chance to tell me afterwards. It gets even stickier because some people think God's blessed the United States. And we have some kind of a right. And it all depends on how it's going and how much we agree with government, right? As to whether or not we have a right. You know, we're the right people of God. And I'm afraid that was Israel. And they didn't do so well. And we have to be very, very careful about thinking we are the privileged ones because that seems to be when we get ourselves in the most trouble. Is when we think we're the ones that God really wants. We're his favorite. After all, God would be for us. How could he allow any injustice with us? Be careful. Because sometimes those things are there, whether it's fair or not. So let me turn it a little bit sideways. Dying is not a sin. Murder is a sin. Can you give a life? Is that right? Can you give a life? Giving your life for something does not seem to be a sin. It's not a problem. We see great faith being done in the name of good. He does say don't murder, but you know what? If you decide to give your life, it isn't because somebody took it. And so we do not commit murder, not actual murder, not social murder, not character assassination, not killing someone's spirit, not calling them names in a fit of anger, not making them angry, not taking our children and exasperating them to the point where they want to become violent. You're brother has something against you go solve it so all of these things he's trying to say let this be a solution let us not have this anger violence let us not have any violence but understand God has control of this earth and he is going to punish and so there is going to be God's way of punishment and so murder is a way of cutting off relationship with someone else we do have to be careful with that there's one other big one that we need to talk about that I usually don't. I know Ashby talks a lot about this. And that's the idea of abortion. We are able to bring people into existence. Don't you find that amazing? That God would trust us with something like that? I mean, really, what was he thinking? That we would be responsible for this? That we could have this little life in our place and and that we would somehow be able to he has a lot of confidence in us doesn't he that's pretty amazing that God gives us the responsibility to protect a life and to be able to raise kids correctly and that they turn out to be people who believe in God and people who follow God and there is a lot of danger and they do need protection and so when does that protection start does it start after birth? Does it start before? Do you take vitamins? You know, they warn stop smoking, stop drinking because it will harm your baby. And then we pass all kinds of laws that say, no, it's okay to kill it. Wait, something doesn't add up. The truth is that what happens in the womb changes the life. It absolutely does. And we now know for medical reasons that birth defects and everything else come from because of treatment of what happens in the womb long before this ever takes place. And so health is up to us before the birth. So how do we treat babies before the birth? See, pregnancy is treated as a child before the birth. And when scripture talks about it, it's God forms us in a womb. Before we were born, he knew us. The personhood is described as being before birth. In fact, children are called by a name. Destiny is set. 
even before birth. When a baby dies, a child is lost. It's not just something that happened, a medical procedure. A child is always treated as human life. Let me give you two examples just so that you'll know from Scripture what these are talking about. Genesis chapter 25 talks about Jacob and Esau. And it describes the pregnancy. I hope none of you ever have this kind of a pregnancy in your family. Because it says that the children struggle together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she, went to, so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided, and one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. And he, so they named they called his name Esau, and afterwards his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. And so his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. It was a hard pregnancy. You know you're in trouble when the kids are fighting inside of you. It is going to get worse when they get outside of you. And so maybe that's why she asked, well, what is going on? Why is this happening to me? Well, it's not happening to you. It's not a punishment of you. It's the fact that this is the nature of your kids. So maybe that's a warning at the beginning. So here they are. The children already know how to fight. They have distinct personalities. They are very different. They have heritage attached to them because there are promises from God that go with this family. Just like God can talk to us about heaven now because we know we're going, because we have done the things we're supposed to do and are one of his children, he could talk about the heritage of their birth. The older one's going to serve the younger one. Normally the older one got the, all the birthright and the majority of the, of the money and the blessing. And he says, nope, it's going to be the younger one this time. What? Before the babies are even born, they are real people. And if they are real people before the birth, then do not murder applies. Just because we're bigger and we can't hear their voice is no reason to allow murder. Scripture does talk about conception as being the beginning of personhood. And so let me give you a second example. This is the example of Jesus. We, if we look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, as the angel comes to Joseph, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the angel appears, and what is conceived in her is going to be your son. Well, wait a second, there's no baby yet, right? I can just put her away and... She's already got the child, and it's going to be God's child. We already know it's going to be God's child. It's not that you can change that, and he's already got a name. His name is going to be Jesus, and his destiny is already set. And so the angel is saying, Joseph, I want you to be part of this child's life. Don't take this out on Mary. He is a person. Luke chapter 1, verse 34, as the angel comes to talk to Mary... Very similar, Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So the angel says to Mary, How, will you, how you will conceive is by the Holy Spirit. This is even before. And here he's saying, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to put a person in there. That's what's going to be. He is known. He will be 
announced, and she knows from the announcement this is who he's going to be. He's going to be Jesus. There is a, a whole lineage attached to him. He comes from the line of David, from Abraham, and you can see all of his ancestors as they're written down, and he is going to be this fulfillment of this promise. Luke 2 and verse 21, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And so Jesus at his circumcision, he's called Jesus because he was named that, he was that, before he was born. And so it's simply a matter of carrying that out. That's what he's trying to get at. The promise is about her conception, about her pregnancy, not well, we hope you have a child, and we'll see how he comes out. And if he comes out, we're going to think he's good. No, it starts long before that. It starts long before that. And so this is the promise that's given to Mary. And you can see that they definitely know Jesus is the child from God. He has promised that both to Mary and to Joseph and a number of Old Testament passages. And it talks about this child at conception. The truth is that babies die. Sometimes. Mourn their loss. Don't think that they don't matter. And we may not have known them much if they die early. But sometimes there's a very strong bond because that was a real person. Give them a name. Again, death is not the issue because sometimes we all die. And whether the baby dies by natural cause or by abortion, babies that die are going to heaven. And that may be the best news in this whole thing. There's joy in that. The babies that die do go to heaven. They do not have sin. They have not entered into anything, and they have not done anything wrong. They are completely innocent before God. And so babies that are aborted are safe with God. That doesn't mean it's okay. And so if you've already had an abortion today... I want you to know that we're not insensitive to that. I want you to know that your baby is safe. And I want you to know that God can forgive anything. After all, God forgave people who killed his child, right? Obviously, he was a lot older, but when they repented, he forgave them. The question becomes, are we killers? Do we honor the life that God gives? Are we the encourager, the one who lifts up, the one who's able to be there? One last passage from Romans 13. He tells them to owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another is fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covenant. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And so here he puts it in perspective. He says, I don't want you to owe anyone anything except to be able to love. Don't let violence get in the way between you and someone else. Don't let anger get in the way between you and someone else. Don't think you're God's appointed person to carry out justice in this world. Uh, even if you've got a black cape, okay? That's not going to make the difference. Let God carry out his own justice, but develop relationships and learn how to love people. And when you can learn how to love people the way Jesus loved us, it makes it so much easier. You're not going to be involved in some of these things that he gives specific prohibition about. And so do what's positive in order to avoid the negative. Do develop places of love. Do have a place that means that we're able to work together. And it all starts with this idea of making a covenant with God. This may be one of the most powerful things you can ever realize. 
is God can take a murder and make something good of it. Whether it's a murder in your life, a murder you committed, or the murder of his son. And he can make something good of it. It is not the end. He says don't murder. And yet he uses his own son and his death who was murdered. And our acceptance of the covenant is very much like what happens that we would repent of our sins and be buried with him in baptism so that we can be raised to walk a new life. And he declares murder null and void because all of us will be in heaven with him if we do this right. That's the one murder that helps us. Jesus died on a cross for our sins. And so I'm thankful for that murder. Only God can make good come out of murder. And there is nothing that you have done in your life that can keep you away from the goodness of God. You have to know that. You have to know that for sure. And we would invite you today, if you have messed up in your life and done things wrong and need prayers for God to be able to forgive you, would you come let us pray for us while we stand and sing?